Today, I want to talk about a topic that I've been thinking about recently, and that is survivorship bias, and how survivorship bias presents itself in the powerlifting world, and how it can create an illusion as to who are good coaches in our community, or interfere with how we interpret the data that we are looking at. First off, what is survivorship bias? Survivorship bias is the act of focusing on the successful people, businesses, or sets of data essentially, and failing to acknowledge the unsuccessful or the um, missing pieces of data uh, that we're analyzing. The classic example goes that in World War II, planes were uh, arriving back with all these bullet holes on them, and the army or whatnot wanted to add extra armor to these planes to make sure that they wouldn't get gunned down. And they analyzed where these planes were getting shot. And what they noticed is that the planes were getting shot, shot primarily all over, except for the cockpit and except for the engine. So naturally, the conclusion was we need to add armor to these parts of the plane so that they don't get gunned down. What they were failing to do is that they failed to acknowledge the fact that what about the planes that didn't make it? What about the planes that didn't survive? These planes were getting shot in the cockpit and in the engine. That's why they weren't making it back. In fact, the planes that were making it back don't need armor on those parts of the plane. By definition, they were making it back. They were still able to fly well. And so what they had to do was actually add armor to the parts of the plane that uh, were getting, uh, that were causing these planes to get gunned down. Another example uh, that we see day, in, day to day is in manufacturing. People often say things like, they don't make them like they used to, you know, in regards to, play, uh, in regards to furniture or cars, for example. But what we're failing to acknowledge is the fact that much of the furniture and cars and other things that are manufactured around us that we are uh, engaging with are the survivors. You know, the furniture, that, that couch that you have that's 25 years old, or the car that's 30 years old that's still going, those are the cars, those are the pieces of um, manufacturing that have survived up to this point. But there are innumerable pieces of furniture and cars, for example, that haven't made it up to this point. And so if we're comparing only the small subset of, of manufacturing that has made it up to this point, then we're not gonna be getting a fair um, a fair conclusion there. Now let's take an example uh, in the powerlifting world. Let's say you had two options, two discrete options when it came to your powerlifting training. Let's say you could choose between program A, which was going to add 100 kilos to your total, but there's a 95% chance that you're going to get injured, or option B, which is a program that is going to add 20 kilos to your total, but there's only a 5% chance you're going to get injured, which program would you choose? Well, mathematically speaking, the best option here would be option B. With option A, the expected value, that is the amount of progress you can expect, is about five kilos. It's obviously 100 kilos if you survive, but on average, one in 20 people, are only, only one in 20 participants will survive. And so the expected value is five kilos. Whereas in the, first, in the second example, example B, the expected value is a 19 kilo improvement to your total, you know, 95% of a 20 kilo improvement. Mathematically, it's very easy to make that decision when you're presented it like that. Of course, in training, it's much more complicated and there's much more data sets that you need to take into consideration. So let's extrapolate this out into a more concrete or into a more um, theoretical example, I should say. Let's say a coach runs a training system that is very aggressive, that will yield really good results, which will add 100 kilos to your total, for example. but the training is so hard and so difficult that only a small part of their roster actually survives and is actually able to see those results. Well, when you look at this coach's roster, what you're going to see is you're going to see all the lifters that have made it. You're going to see the lifters and their clients that have survived because all the lifters that got injured, all the lifters that didn't make it, they all cancel their coaching subscription. They don't post on social media about it. They don't um, make any commentary about it. But what you do see is the ones that are surviving. Imagine this then. Imagine a coach has such a strong reputation, has such a strong following, that they get dozens and dozens of inquiries every week. And they take on all these people, and then they put them on this really hard training. And of the dozens, if not hundreds of clients that they churn through every year, maybe 5%, maybe 20 or 30 of those lifters survive and they add 100 kilos to the total. And so when you go to look up this coach, you notice that this coach has a full roster of very successful lifters. But what's the data set that you're missing? 
It's all the lifters that didn't make it to that point. All the lifters that didn't survive. This was something that um, I experienced when I was in my early days as a powerlifting coach and I was comparing myself to other coaches who were much more quote unquote successful than I was. I remember specifically a certain coach who was producing, who produced numerous champions, numerous Australian champions. And I was wondering, what am I doing wrong? Why am I not producing this many uh, good level lifters? But the funny thing is the reputation that this coach had actually was that they often broke their lifters. It was actually a running joke. Uh, this coach breaks their lifters, all their lifters get injured. And what I realized was that I was focusing on the small subset of results of the lifters that were surviving. Luckily, I was close enough to this coach to actually see the lifters that weren't making it. But I can imagine that if I was a bit more zoomed out, if I didn't know this coach on a more personal level, I wouldn't have seen all this data that was being missed by a lot of people. And so I would say that it can be very deceptive when you go to choose a coach for yourself or you go to assess the merits of a coach out there, it would be very deceptive to only or to hyper-focus on the lifters that are surviving, on the lifters that are um, making it through the rigors of the hard training that this coach might potentially be putting their lifters through. Now, that's not to say that uh, a good coach shouldn't be producing good lifters. Of course not. But what I suggest doing when you go to analyze or when you go to assess the merits or the quality of a coach is to try to find the average, to try to find the median results that they're getting, not just the ones that are surviving, but also the results of those that, um, that you might be missing or asking yourself, what kind of turnover is this coach getting or why are clients leaving this coach? It's also worthwhile considering the type of clients or the type of people that this coach is attracting. So for example, imagine a, again, a coach has a really strong reputation and they get lots of inquiries and they have a reputation of coaching high level lifters. Naturally, they're gonna get a lot of inquiries from high level lifters. And naturally, the roster is gonna be, be then full of high level lifters. It's a self-fulfilling uh, cycle where the, lifter, the coach has a good reputation, they get lots of inquiries, they choose to only take on the high level lifters and they choose to reject or decline lifters that are more intermediate or more beginner level. And so you think, wow, this coach is coaching so many good lifters, but how many of them um, were already good when they started? And also how many uh, lifters were refused or declined or didn't make the cut or weren't actually taken on by that coach? I know many really, really good coaches out there that don't have a roster of elite level clients, but instead they attract the more average type of client, the more day-to-day -day recreational type of lifter, and they produce really good results with the with the type of clientele that they have. But when you go to look at their roster and you think, oh, this coach doesn't coach anyone elite, they mustn't be very good. That's not a very fair assessment. So what I'm encouraging you to do here is to consider the type of clients that this coach is attracting, the number or the sheer volume of clients that this coach would, would be attracting, and try to make a more fair assessment as to whether or not this coach is actually producing the results that you as a potential customer or client might want. That's all I've got today for you guys. If this resonates with you or if you've got any questions or comments, please leave them down below and I'd be happy to engage with you. I understand that this might be a bit of a fiery topic and I swear that I am not uh, throwing shade at anyone in specific, uh, anyone specifically. Um, it's just an observation that I've uh, noticed or I've had and I've been thinking about recently. So I'd love to be able to hear more about your thoughts and comments uh, down below. So looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, I... Ugh. This with one take, no errors. Yeah. Topic that's been on my mind for quite a while now. Oh, I hate the quite a while now. That sucks. Today I want to talk about a topic that has been on the 